Hey everyone, and welcome to an overview of cupola melting. I'm Jeremy Mallory. I'm an FEF alum from Mississippi State. Uh, I'm currently vice chairman of American Foundry Society's cupola committee. And for the past 13 years, I've worked as the melting engineer at American Cast Iron Pipe Company in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, my goal today is really just to cover the basics of cupola melting in about 10 minutes. So the cupola furnace itself is a vertical cylindrical furnace. It has a water-cooled steel shell, and that steel shell is typically refractory lined, though there are several that are unlined. Uh, they are operated by blasting hot air into the lower section of the furnace, here where the nozzles are, uh, and to burn foundry coke or cupola coke. Um, also, along with the hot air, uh, most cupolas use oxygen injection or enrichment to increase the combustion rate. Uh, these, furnaces are con these furnaces are continuous melting, uh, so there's not uh, botting and tapping or it's not really done in batches, typically uh, uh, you're melting 24-7. And compared to blast furnaces, which are similar, uh, these have relatively short campaigns. So you, you normally run them for a week, two weeks, maybe, maybe four weeks at a time. Uh, the highest melt rate cupola in the U.S. currently melts over 120 tons an hour. Cupola furnaces are used to produce both gray and ductile iron, uh, and they can be done really in the same furnace. Uh, for the shops that have to make different grades of iron, whether it's switching between gray and ductile, or, or different grades of gray or different grades of ductile, uh, they have to pay special attention to their charge materials and where they are in the stack. Uh, Often, a holding furnace is used to help with these transitions or just to serve as a production buffer between the cupola furnace and the casting line. Right now, there's 42 cupolas in, in use in the U.S. Uh, among 23 companies. Of course, that's uh, just commercial use. There's a lot of universities and other entities that have small, uh, small cupolas. Those 42 cupolas produce a little over 6 million tons of iron, which represents the majority of domestic foundry iron production. Uh, to produce this much iron, uh, typically uh, 800,000 tons of cupola coke or foundry coke is consumed annually. Uh, and just to give you an idea also of, uh, of how large some of these are, the top 10 cupola foundries in the U.S. Uh, produce over 4 million tons out of that 6 million. So really, uh, it's top heavy. Really, the top 10 cupolas in the U.S. Uh, outproduce uh, all of the other ones in, in the U.S. The cupola charge is made of iron returns, purchased cast iron, plate and structural steel, shredded steel, and pig iron. Those are your typical uh, steels and irons that are used. Uh, the alloys that are typically used in cupolas are ferrosilicon and silicon carbide, which are added for uh, silicon additions. And then coke serves as the fuel. Uh, coke's not only the fuel, but it's also your source of carbon. I'll go over that in the next slide as well. And then the last item on there is limestone used to flux the slag, which will also be covered in the next slide. All of these charged materials are put into the top of the cupola uh, in batches. And you can see in this cutaway, there's different layers of, of scrap metal and coke. And as the coke at the bottom of the, of the furnace is combusted and consumed, the scrap metals move downward and the coke from each charge replenishes the coke at the bottom of the furnace. Uh, the liquid iron can then run out the tap hole at the bottom of the furnace. 
as I said earlier, uh, coke is the main source of fuel in a cupola. Uh, it's not only there for combustion, uh, but is also there to provide carbon uh, to your charge mix. So, so you, if you charge in a lot of steel and you're trying to produce iron, you typically need to pick up somewhere around 3% carbon, and that's done through diffusion as those uh, steel droplets uh, run over the coke in the coke bed of the furnace. Here's a closer view of the uh, nozzles that are used in cupolas. Uh, what you're seeing there, that orange, is a cast copper piece with water channels in it to keep it cool, and it's used to, um, to project that air right to the center of the furnace for good combustion. Typically, that air is preheated to somewhere around 1,000 degrees, and again, oxygen can either be mixed with that air or it can be injected through a supersonic nozzle. The melt rate of the different furnaces are determined by blast rate and your oxygen rate and your charge mix. Here's a simple view of um, the different zones in the furnace itself. So the coke bed is the lower portion of the furnace around those nozzles or tweers. Uh, it's typically between, uh, from the bottom, uh, to 6 to 60 inches above those tweers. At the bottom of the coke bed is the well, and that's where there's a pool of liquid and iron and slag that flow out of the furnace. Uh, right at the nozzles, or at the tweers, is an area of oxidation, where as the, the uh, air and the oxygen comes in, there's a lot of free oxygen and a lot of chemical reactions that happen in that area. Just above and below that, uh, you will have very high temperatures from the combustion and, and no free oxygen. It's a prime uh, area for reduction of, of different oxides. Just above the coke bed is the melt zone. The air at that point has just been combusted and it's typically, it can be anywhere from 2100 to 2800 degrees. So hot enough to melt iron or steel. Anything above that melt zone is considered the upper stack or the preheat zone. And that's where really the thermal efficiency of a cupola comes in. Uh, as that hot air travels up the stack, it gives away all of its heat uh, to, the stack, to the charge material as it moves downward. Ideally, you'd like for that gas to be down to 200 degrees as you're pulling it out the top of the furnace. There are lots of sources of slag in a cupola. One is the ash from the coke, also any refractory you lose, any oxidation that may occur with the silicon and the iron, uh, magnesium, manganese, aluminum, etc. Uh, there's also dirt and sand that are in the metals along with rust. Uh, typically two to 15% of your charge weight is gonna be converted to a, a slag. To take care of that, typically limestone is added to flux that slag. So the limestone will lower the melting point of the slag and also increase the fluidity so that, that slag can easily be separated from the iron and removed from the furnace. This diagram here shows the bottom of a typical cupola furnaces in the U.S. Uh, most cupolas in the U.S. are considered to be front and slagging cupolas. So that means that the iron and the slag both come out of the furnace through the tap hole, through a single tap hole. And then outside of the furnace, the slag is diverted to a, a, another area of the plant and iron continues down the trough. There are some cupolas in the U.S., and this is more rare, that are rear slagging. So you actually have two different holes in the furnace that are different elevations. So the iron comes out of one hole and the slag comes out of a slightly uh, elevated hole on the back side of the, the cupola. As for the refractories that are used inside of the cupolas, you can divide that into three zones. The well and the tap hole area, so this is below that oxidation zone, 
you really just see high temperatures. You don't see oxidation. You don't really see the abrasion of all your charge materials coming downward. In those areas, you use uh, high uh, conductivity uh, materials, such as carbon and silicon carbide refractories. Uh, in the melt zone area where you see high temperatures and oxidation and abrasion and numerous chemical reactions, uh, the best that you can do is use a refractory that matches your slag or closely matches your slag. Most of the time, that's a high alumina refractory that's used on the hot face. If possible, a lot of times you can't do this on smaller furnaces, but on larger furnaces, if you can, put a high carbon or silicon carbide refractory behind that alumina hot face uh, to increase heat transfer and to keep that hot face cool. In the upper portion or the upper stack, you have lower temperatures, no oxidation. You really just have abrasion. Alumina and silicon carbide refractories are used here because, uh, because they work well against abrasion. Well, I think I've covered the basics in about in, in the ten, 10 minutes allotted. I appreciate you tuning in. Hopefully uh, you look for more of these Foundry technical presentations that are coming soon. Thank you again. Hope you have a great day.